Hey there everybody, it's Nathan Cool with NathanCoolPhoto.com and in this tutorial I want to show how you can shoot a high definition, high resolution virtual tour using almost any camera and almost any lens. Now you might be familiar with shooting uh, this technique with a DSLR and a fisheye lens as I show in some of my prior videos and that's typical of you would put a fisheye lens on here and you'd take then four shots around at 90 degrees each and then you might uh, shoot one straight up and of course on a pano head so you don't get that parallax error. Um, also by the way there's a video on that in the description for this video as well as other pertinent links that you can find regarding some of the prior videos and also my ebook on virtual tour photography for real estate. You won't need that necessarily for this tutorial but it could help as it does have a bit of a more of a primer into some of the things I'm going to be talking about here. Some of this you might be familiar with though once again if we were just shooting a fisheye lens on this it's got a angle of view of 180 degrees meaning that this shows everything if it were to be a fisheye lens so we only have to rotate about 90 degrees to allow each image to overlap as it gets stitched so there's enough of common area for the panorama to be stitched in post-processing using software like PT GUI. I'm going to go through all of that as well as knowing by knowing the angle of view of the particular lens that you have on your camera what you would calculate that out to as far as how many rotation turns, also known as columns, and then how many rows you might have to do by tilting your camera up or down. When we're shooting with a fisheye lens, there's only one row, just all the way around, and there's four columns. We just go 90 degrees, then 180, 270, back to zero. But when we're shooting with an angle of view that's not quite 180, then we have to change that. I'm going to get into those calculations shortly, but cutting to the chase on some of that, what that means is that I might have to, for instance, on this 28 millimeter lens that I'm going to use in this example, I would have to go about 30 degrees on each turn instead of 90. So I'd have a whole lot more columns, and then I'm going to have a lot more rows because I'm going to have to take the camera and tilt it down, for instance, to 60 degrees and then do a, a whole series of rotations on that. Then I'd have to move that back up to about 30 degrees and then I'd have to do a whole lot of rotations on that as well and keep going up to then the zero position, another 30 higher, 60 higher. So I've got a lot of pictures. It would turn out to be about 60 images. So I'll run through that, how you can figure out how many images it would take as well. Now there's some benefits to doing this even if it isn't a matter of, of not having a fisheye lens and you want to just try this with whatever camera you have is that this technique is used for very high resolution 360 panos. Now if you're doing stuff for a lot of real estate and people are looking this on this uh, your tours on a phone or a tablet not such a big deal. Some businesses though want to be able to have people to zoom in and so they want a higher definition. So this has more use than just let's try this because I don't have a fisheye lens. You should try this anyways as this is a technique that you can get down to provide to other type of uh, markets so a higher end markets. So that's the basics of it. So to cover though what it would look like, this is me doing a typical 360 pano. Fisheye lens, just doing four shots around, doing the zenith shot, I come back, I'm done. That's it. We're going to take that uh, particular pano and we're going to compare the results to now the next example. Here's me with the 28 millimeter lens and to not bore you because it will take five minutes speeding this up, seeing all the different rows and columns that I have to shoot to make this, taking a total of 60 images, <gasps> yeah, it's a lot of work. But the stitching process really doesn't take that much longer to put that together. Now if you were to try to add flash into this, as I show in some of the other videos, that would be very difficult. So in this particular example, just to have apples to apples comparison, I didn't do window pulls, that's why some of this is blown out, I'm just shooting this in my house as an example. So you can see how this is done. So to get into more detail of this, what I'd like to do now is start breaking down the angle of view so you can calculate with your lens what that means and then also some of the problems that you can encounter while you're going through the stitching process. Having such a large panorama does introduce 
possibly more problems. Having smaller areas that you might see might also give stitching errors where you might not even have anything that could overlap. For instance, a plain blue sky. Very typical in uh, Southern California, for instance, where we're going to get patches and the stitching software won't have common points to line that up. There's simple fixes for this. We're going to be using PT GUI, analyzing some of this in Mars Apano, and then we're going to get into the how you can use this better for your virtual tour photography. So without further ado, let's get down to the nitty gritty of how this is all put together. So the key to all of this for figuring it out is the angle of view. It's a spec that's on every single lens. So look up the lens that you have on the camera that's mounted. You can find that. All the way over on the left, we've got this 180 degree fisheye. That was a 12 millimeter Samyang, like the one that I recommend in the book. I also recommend on the other videos. Being a fisheye lens, it has a 180 degree uh, angle of view, so it does capture everything in front of it. So there's fewer rotations needed for it. The same focal length on a zero distortion lens, the 12 millimeter, 12 millimeter Liowa, which you might be familiar with as that zero D lens, it's very popular for video, uh, that only has 121 degree angle of view, so it's less. And then we start getting lower and lower as we get into, for instance, the, uh, the 20 millimeter Nikon, only 94 uh, degrees. And the one we're gonna use in this example, the 28 millimeter Nikon, only 74 degrees. Uh, of uh, angle of view. So that is very limiting. So it means, as you can see here, just physically, that with so little showing up in its angle of view, that we're gonna have to have more images that will overlap to put this together. So what I've done here is put together a uh, table with some calculations to show what I mean when it comes to angle of view, what you'd need for your rows positions, and then how many shots that will take. So we start up at the top here with the uh, 12 millimeter fisheye Samyang, the Liowa, and some of the other ones, and then what we're gonna be concentrating on here today will be this difference between the 28 millimeter Nikon and the 12 millimeter Samyang. Let me though step through what this is, what all this means real quick so that you can get an idea to use this calculation for yourself. The column over here on B is the angle of view. You get that off the specs on your lens mounted on your camera. And then all you have to do to figure the overlap rotation, it's 50% of that angle of view. This is how much overlap you want if you want to have really reliable stitching. So for instance here you can see the calculation done in a spreadsheet is just multiplied times half. So that's all that is. So you can see even down here on the 50 millimeter Nikon we've got the overlap rotation angle at 23. So with a 46 degree angle of view we want to figure on 23 as our angles. Now we have to round that up to the actual positions on our panel pano head because taking a look here at a close-up of the pano head, we can see that there are certain positions that you would put those lock knobs in. And also, if you're unfamiliar with these, check out the link for the lock knob video uh, that I did just here recently so you can kind of get a better idea how those differ across different pano heads. Anyways, these are typical, so 90, 60, 45, 30, 15, and that's why we have to kind of round down. So luckily on the 12 millimeter Liowa, it was almost at 60, so we could use 60, and then 20 millimeter Nikon down to 45. You can see then how then we had to on these two guys here, had to go down to about 30. And then if we were to go to the 50 millimeter Nikon, it's down to 15. So that makes a big difference. Next up, these are the positions you would use for knob one and two. So for instance, when we take a look at the 28 millimeter Nikon, you can see that, yep, we've got it locked knob one in our 60 degree position. When we turn around to the other side and take a look at knob two, that's 60 divided by two. That gives us then that 30 degrees of rotation that we're after. Now, this also is the tilt that we're going to put on the uh, pano head to look up, down, and all that. And that's then where we break down the different rows and the different columns, as I mentioned earlier, and these would then be the row positions that we're looking at. So how far would you tilt it up and down? So you can see here when we're doing our standard uh, Samyang, 
uh, fisheye, it's just the 90 degree position or zero position on, on many pano heads. And the same thing here when we get to the Liowa, it's very similar, but we still have to have three rows and we also have to have three rows on the 20 millimeter Nikon. When we get into the one we're testing today, the 28 millimeter, you can see there's five different row positions. So I had to go negative 30, 60, back to zero or 90 degrees, uh, 60, and then 30. So that comes out to 12 columns, comes out to five rows total number of shots is 60. Now that's a lot of shots that have to be taken and then to be stitched together. So if you were to try to incorporate flash that would be way too many shots, way too many shots to even think about incorporating flash. That's why incorporating flash to apply flambient using the fisheye lens at most with window poles you're looking at 15 shots maybe even not that much if you're not going to be doing window poles you would just be doubling it one for ambient one for flash so you'd have maybe 10. So that's uh, taking a look at the number of shots and you can see how it differs greatly. The, if you use a fisheye lens down here, there's just five shots and not that much more if you use the 12 millimeter Liowa, but once you get up, like even here, the 28 millimeter Nikon, we're gonna do 60 shots. And once you get beyond that, it's just way out of control. And you can see that here by comparing the angle of view to the total number of shots. Our break even point to even have any type of effort whatsoever is about our 60 shots, which is then the angle of view, which that gets down to about the 63 mark. And that happens to be where we're really pushing the limit if we use like a 35 millimeter uh, focal length on our camera, which would should have, and the Nikon anyways, has a 63 degree angle of view. And if if you have a 35 millimeter lens or something equivalent that you're using on a zoom lens, then of course it'd probably be around that range. So anyways, that's the basic calculation. If that was a little too fast for you, I do apologize. Uh, feel free to rewind. There's a lot more information here coming ahead on how to apply this. So we can take a look at the footage here. This is using View NXI, just so we can see it. I've converted these files to TIFF um, for reasons I've mentioned before. I wouldn't do this normally for a lot of real estate photography, but for when you really want to make sure that you've got uh, the same details that come out of the camera raw, you can't leave it up to Adobe to decode that for you. Use your OEM software. So anyways, we've got our typical uh, four shots around. This was done using the Samyang 12 millimeter, and it looks very fisheye but it didn't take much. One, two, three, four, and then our uh, zenith shot up here. So we've got that, didn't take an adir shot, I'll just put a patch in that. So a very simple uh, process here to do this. So we can bring this over into PT GUI by just taking these four images, one, two, excuse me, five, we take these over here and then we can just go into the same process you've seen me do before. They've been dragged over there and we're just gonna go to align images. It's done, boom we've got our pano, not a big deal. So that went very, very quick. We can see where the overlap was. There's just five images. You can see number five was used up here for the zenith. And then we've got number one was in the center. So that was very, very simple. So not a big deal. Let's uh, now do the 28 millimeter and see what the difference is. So let's just do a new project. Let's not save that. And let's go back over here to the 28 millimeter. Now, in here, we've got a lot of footage. Once again, I converted these all to TIFF, and you can see there's 60 images that we'd have to select and drag over. Now, this will take a little bit longer, but PT GUI is pretty fast. We'll put those in there, and then we'll go to align images. Now, here, there's enough detail throughout the house to where there's enough information to overlap these images but stay tuned because I'm going to show you something outside where it won't and by using a technique in PT GUI you can make it align almost every single time. So you can see this is taking longer you probably hear the fans running to cool off the CPUs in my PC here and you can see there's a lot of numbers that show up here. So we take a look at the overlap here in the panorama editor. A lot of images that were done here to put this whole 
whole thing together, but you know what? It actually did a good job of stitching it. So we've got a pretty good panel. Now the problem is though, is the more images that you introduce, the more problems you have potential that you're also going to be introducing. So you could get more stitching errors. We can see a little bit that's probably happening up here. We can go into the detail viewer and take a look. And sure enough, there is a little bit of a stitching error there. I could probably fix that um, in, uh, in post, not a big deal. Some of it's really going on there. So I won't spend the time here to go over the control points and how to fix that, but you've seen me do this before and I talk about it in the book as well. So the stitching process isn't that bad. And of course then, if you liked everything that you would do, then you would just create the panorama just like you would do before. And I've shown this, it's just the third step in the PT GUI process where you select the TIFF. I like to output it as TIFF. Notice though the size here by default, this guy is huge, 29,000 pixels wide. And you might think, wow, that's fantastic to put up there for a virtual tour, but the problem is, is that there's size limits. So for instance, a uh, Cloud Pano only allows you to upload a 50 megabyte maximum image. Uh, Mars Pano has to be 23,000 pixels wide maximum. And even if you do use a host or software that allows you to use a bigger image like this size, bear in mind, it's going to be big. To give you an example, that uh, image was, when it was done, and I stitched the TIFF together, was about three and a half gig big. That's a lot to download onto somebody's iPhone if they're just going to be cruising around through that. When we take a look at what happened with the, uh, the 12 millimeter, it was only a little over a half a gig. So about uh, 600 megabytes is all that that was. Let's go over here to Photoshop and see some of what it took to put that together. So these were the outputs. This is the 28 millimeter output, and this is the uh, 12 millimeter. And you can see here, there's definitely more of a nadir patch that's needed here um, compared to when I did this. And yes, by the way, I left this cat toy over here. My cat <laughs> had been playing with me uh, before I'd started this video. So my apologize, but uh, yes, I, I am a cat person, so excuse a little orange cat toy. But this is just for an example here. And uh, by the way, to see these finished ones live, there's a link to the description uh, in the description for the video so you can compare the 28 and the 12 and I'm going to show those here shortly. Real quick though, what I did to show the comparison here was I uh, duplicated each layer on this. So we'll go over here and do it on the, uh, this one first. Just hit Control J to duplicate the layer. You've seen me probably do this before. And then I go up to Filter. I'd select Camera Raw Filter. And I might apply a preset, but whatever you want to do, this is the time that you would do your editing. So probably cool that down just a little bit like that. Uh, take out some of those highlights, take those down, uh, raise the shadows um, that I can, a little bit of whites, up the black, some clarity, add a bunch of sharpening to it with a mask. This is just standard camera raw stuff, just like you would in Lightroom. And now we've got something that looks pretty good. I can even see a, a nice detail on everything as it's showing up. So I like the look of that. A lot of good detail, um, a lot of stuff going through. So we'll just say, okay. That's all fine. So that guy's ready, and I would just then flatten him and save him as a JPEG, unless I wanted to do the Nadir patch, which all I would do then, here's my patch that I apply, and I show that once again in the book if you wanted to cover this up, and you'll see that in the example uh, here shortly. Going over to the uh, 28 millimeter example, it would be the same thing. I would just go Control J, I would do Camera Raw Filter, and of course, since I applied it, so we can do apples and apples, I'll just apply the same thing here. So we've got an apples and apples comparison. We can save those out and then see what that looks like. So you can see it's taken a lot longer to apply this because it's a very large image. And also I can't just use this image right out of Photoshop and save it as a JPEG without resizing it first. It's gonna be way too big. So once this is done, which it's still cranking away, trying to apply all that camera raw filter, this mega, mega, mega pano done with the 28 millimeter lens. And once it's done, look at that, now it's applying it all. Oh, I'm so sorry for the delay, but this is one of the things you'll come across, especially if you don't have a very fast computer and you try to pull this off. There's a lot of information. Boom, now it's applied. Now we'll just layer flatten. And then I need to resize this. So the maximum size for Marzipano is 23,000 pixels wide. So I need to resize that image and we'll go to 23. 
8,000. That would be our maximum. That's going to take a little while too for it to run through all of that. We'll just go in there to fit. And then I can just save that as a JPEG like I did the other one. So that's already been saved and I have that over in the, uh, the website that I have also linked and here it is. Here's a screenshot of it, but go to the uh, to the website. I've got a link to that for these two examples, so you can uh, cruise around by yourself and see the resolution a little bit better. So, anyways, this is 28 millimeter. At first glance, looks really, really good. Um, there might there's a few stitching errors maybe here and there, and we can really go in and point those out that I didn't fix um, in post. If we go to the 12 millimeter, looking at that same initial angle, looks good. So we can go back and forth. They look about the same. There's really not that much difference when you first take a look at it. This is where the difference now will come in is if you were to zoom and if a user were to zoom in on your pano. So let's zoom in first with the 12 millimeter. So I'm going to go in all the way here to the piano. We can barely make out what the manufacturer of that piano is. You can kind of see Kimball there, but it still doesn't look bad. It's really sharp, really nice. Um, it's not really distorted when you zoom in. So that's all fine. When we go to the 28 millimeter though, and now when we zoom in 100%, you can clearly see that the manufacturer is Kimball. It's also very, very sharp. So you can even see all the dust that's on the piano up here. I really need to dust that piano. Uh, so anyways, it does provide a lot more detail. But once again, there are limitations on what you can do with getting something this big up there and how long that would take to load on somebody that's gonna be viewing this particular version virtual tour. Okay, now let's take a look at some other problems that can come up when you're doing such large panos. So here's one that I did. I took a little bit of a shortcut and I didn't use all uh, 60. I did a rotation of, uh, of 60, negative 60, and uh, zero on the pano head anyways for my rows. The thing is though, this is my backyard, my little postage stamp backyard, and you can see that some of these images are just plain blue sky. There's really nothing to overlap. So there's no way that PT GUI is gonna get good control points. And this can happen too, if you're shooting something that has a plain white wall and you're really trying to zoom in with like a 50 millimeter lens, you might see this as well. So easy fix for it though, let's first identify the problem. Let me grab all these and I'm gonna drag those over into PT GUI and we'll say align images just like we normally would. Now this won't take as long because it's just 36 images. Once again, I had converted these to TIFF, so I've got a really good uh, resolution and color like I would out of the camera, not relying on Lightroom and Adobe products to figure that out. Immediately, PT GUI says, this is screwed up, and you can see how screwy it is because stuff didn't align in the blank blue sky. So it's asking me if I want to add control points. At this point, say, no, you don't. It's going to be a waste. So here we can see then too, let's turn on the overlap icon. We can see image 27. It should be up here. It doesn't know that it should go there. I don't know why PT GUI doesn't put it up there by default, but it's an easy enough thing to fix. Go back over to the main window of PT GUI. What you wanna do now is you want to go to align images. It's under, excuse me, align to grid. That's under project. And what that will do then is it will take the order of your images and order those first, which you would think PT GUI would have done first, but it didn't. So let's just say align to grid. The the thing you have to make sure that you have checked here is stretch to a 360 pano. So by default, they typically don't. Also, we want to do all images, but there's a lot of options here, and PT GUI has more information on there. Let's click Apply. Now let's go back to our panorama editor. We can see that now it put the images back into a grid, but the problem we have here now is that it isn't stitched very well. So Big problem solved though, the images are where they're supposed to be. So we can get rid of this align to grid. We've got that. Let's go back to the main window here and let's now apply control points. So you go to the control points menu and you just go generate control points. 
Then it'll start using where it now knows those images should be and make control points where it can. I said I don't know why it didn't do this to begin with. If you were to go back to the panorama editor, you wouldn't see any change yet because another step you have to do is run the optimizer, which it prompts you to do here in step number two. So you run the optimizer, says that it's looking very good. Go back to our panorama editor and it did stitch it well, but you can see how wonky it looks. Very simple on now our third step is you just want to straighten it. And there's that little icon up here for straighten panorama. You just click that button and boom, panorama straightened. We can turn this off and on to, uh, to see the seams and not the seams. You can see it now did a pretty good job of stitching. There's a little bit of stitching error over here, things you could fix with more control points. But anyways, those are the steps then that you would take if you have a blank sky or blank areas when you're using using a non-fisheye lens. If you're using a fisheye lens, you're capturing so much, I, I haven't seen this yet using a fisheye. If though you're trying to do a very high resolution 360 pano, especially outside, you're almost inevitably going to see this problem. But once again, it's easy enough to fix in PT GUI with this technique. Well, I hope this video was useful for you and that you can use some of this in your photography as well. If you did like this video, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. It won't cost anything, and as soon as one of these videos is posted, you'll be the first to know. Thanks a lot for watching. Until next time, take care, be safe, and get out there and shoot something.